Perfect time's a charm, right? Okay, we've been talking about two different kinds of aquifers up to this point of the semester. We have talked about unconfined aquifers. Sometimes called water table aquifers. And again, what's the definition of the water table? We had several, but you can give me your favorite. I really like that definition because you said plain, and we're going to use that in our nef next definition. So the water table is actually a plane that represents the boundary between the saturated and unsaturated zone. So as I said, I like the word plane because when I draw when I draw this in class a lot of times, I make this the surface, right? And then I have this boundary between the unsaturated zone here and the saturated zone below. But in three dimensions, this boundary is actually a plane, okay? Or plane really isn't the best word because it undulates, but it's a, it's a surface, okay? So it's a surface that represents the boundary between the saturated and the unsaturated zone, okay? So we've talked about that a little bit. So in three dimensions, this is a surface. So... That is what we've been looking at when we talk about the unconfined aquifers. But over the last few weeks, we've been talking about confined aquifers. And the thing about confined aquifers is that they are totally saturated. So there is no boundary between the unsaturated zone and a saturated zone in a confined aquifer. The whole confined aquifer is saturated. So, but when we drill into these confined aquifers, the water level tends to rise up within it, right? So let me try to draw a confined aquifer. No, I struggle with my drawings here, so I'm gonna try my best to do this. So let's go to here. This one. So here's this is going to be our confining layer. Okay. And I guess we can put in a another confining layer here. So we have confining layer here, we have a confining layer here, and this is our confined aquifer. Now over in this region here, it may be unconfined and you might have a water table, but all the rest of this is saturated, okay? So this is one big saturated zone. And within that, there's no unsaturated zone. So there's no water table in there, right? But let's say we drill a well right here, okay? And let's say the water level rises up to right about here.
And let's say we draw another well a little farther down. And the water level maybe rises to right here. And let's say we draw one more well here. And let's say at this well, the water level rises to right there. So you've got three levels of water rise in these different wells, right? So here is the level for well one. This is the level for well two. And this is the level for well three. Okay. If you connect the heights of all the wells, it actually will form a surface in 3D just like the water table does. That's what this is right here. So it might look something like that. It's not really the water table. We give it a different term and it's called the potentiometric surface. This is a word you hear a lot in groundwater studies. The definition of the potentiometric surface, it's an imaginary surface created by the total head levels in a confined aquifer. And remember with the water table, water flows downhill, right? And in a water table, the water flows down the gradient of the water table. It happens that way with the potentiometric surface. Since the water is highest at well one, lowest at well three, water flow in this saturated zone will be from well one towards well three. And the steeper that potentiometric surface, the faster the water is likely to flow. Okay. So I think I have a better diagram in the next slide here. So let's just move forward and we'll come back to these terms. Okay, so yeah, here's some things that are going on, all right? So in this right here, this is an unconfined aquifer. It has a water table. And then this layer right here is confined, right? Okay, so that is a confined aquifer. Basically, the entire aquifer is saturated. And when you poke wells into it, the water level rises. In this first well right here, you can see it rises up to, I'm going to make this red, rises up to that level right there. The second one is a flowing well. The water level actually rises up above the ground surface. This line right here is the potentiometric surface for this confined aquifer right here. That makes sense? You guys seeing how that works? 
just the level to which water would rise under hydrostatic pressure in a confined aquifer. And it typically slopes, just like the water table does. It doesn't always mimic the surface like the water table, but it'll have a pattern to it, okay? And you can see that it slightly dips from left to right. All right, so that brings us to the final term I want to introduce today, which is called the hydraulic gradient. This will be one of the more important terms that we will deal with the rest of the semester. This is the maximum slope along the potentiometric surface. So basically, it's calculated really simply. It's the number of feet dropped. This can be in feet or meters over the distance. Also in feet. Sometimes it's expressed in feet per mile. A lot of times it's feet per feet and the feet cancel out and you're left with just the ratio that expresses the hydraulic gradient. I'm gonna give you a chance here in a second to actually use it in real life, okay? But do you understand the concept? It's just the dip of the potentiometric surface. The steeper the dip, the faster the water is generally gonna move. Yeah. So is it the yep. Okay. Yeah, so let me, I'm going to show you this in the next example, okay? Because all I have here are two dimensions, and this is really a three-dimensional problem. So let me give you a three-dimensional problem on the next slide, and we'll go through it, okay? Any other questions before I get there? Okay, so potentiometric surface, the level to which water rises and wells from the same confined aquifer. Over an area, it creates a surface. And the hydraulic gradient is simply kind of the maximum grade along that surface. All right? So let's go to a topographic map, okay? This is from the Black Hills of South Dakota. Let me give you three wells, okay? I'm going to make one well right here. This is going to be our well one. Let me give you another well right here. This is gonna be well two. And we'll have a third well down here, well three. All of these wells are gonna drill down into a confined aquifer and water is gonna rise up to a certain level, okay? Let's say at well one, the water, so it will just say the total head at well one equals 3,500 feet, okay? Let's say at well two, let me put a little one under that one to denote it. So our total head at well two is going to be, let's just make it, 3570. Total head at well three. Let's make it 3. I'm just making this up. So total at well three, let's make it 3520 feet. Okay, so you drill down 
Where well one is, the water level rises to 3,500 feet. You drill down well two, it rises a little higher, 3,570, okay? Well three, 3,520, sort of in between those two. Which way do you think the water's flowing? Always flows from high pressure to low or high total head to low total head. So how do you think water would generally flow in this area? North, south, east, west, northwest, southwest, northeast, southeast, what direction? Okay, that has the lowest Total head, right? That is the lowest pressure. What has the highest pressure? Well, two, okay. And well, three sort of in the middle, right? So in general, you would think it's going to flow sort of that way. We can do better, okay? We can do better than, so you're just sort of eyeballing it like I was, right? We can do better. This is called the three-point problem. If you had structural geology, you may have used sort of a derivation of this. It's really simple to sort of figure out what the maximum grade of that potentiometric surface is. So kind of follow me on this, and you may want to sort of jot down your notes here, um, just sort of the general scheme. So what we're going to do, let me find a good color for this. Now let's use red. Red's always pretty visible. You make a little triangle out of these three wells, okay? Well, well one is 3,500, right? Well, two is 3570. So if you sort of contour this, you would have a 3510 about there, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70. Okay, I'm not going to put the 35, but this would be 3510, 3520, 3530. 3540, 3550, 3560, and 3570, right? What about between well one and three? Well one is 3500, right? Well two is 35, I said that wrong. Let's do well one and well three, okay? Well one is 3,500, well three is 3,520, right? If we contour every 10, that means that sort of right in the middle here, you're gonna have a 3,510, right? Between well two and three, since well three is 3,520, well two is 3,570, difference of 50, if you scale it out, this would be maybe 30, 40, 50, 60. So this is 30, 40, 50, 60. Okay? So those represent sort of lines of equal head, equal total hydrostatic head. And then what you can do is simply sort of connect those. The 60s connect, the 50s connect, the 40s connect, the 30s connect, the 20s connect, the 10s connect, and you have to make an assumption about the zero. Now, water tends to follow the greatest gradient. The greatest gradient is the shortest line between these paths, right? So what that means is, let's use use blue, okay? So that's the shortest line between those two contours. There's the shortest line between those two contours. 
and so on. So the steepest path would look something like this. So that would be the direction of water flow. So it's pretty much east to west, but not quite. There's a little southern component to it, right? The other thing we can do from this is calculate the gradient. And that's kind of the important part of this. So you can see from, let's say, this point right here, which is 3560, to this point right here, which is 3510. That's a drop of 50 feet, right? 50 feet in total head, that surface drops. Right here, let's see, let me do a little star here. So right there, that's at 3560. Right there is at 3510. So it's dropped 50 feet from here to here. That surface, the potentiometric surface, drops 50 feet from there to there. Over what kind of distance? Can you calculate the distance from this point right here, 3560 potentiometric surface, to here, 3510? Do you have anything on your map that would tell you the distance? Yeah, you guys see the squares here, right? See all these squares that exist on this topographic map? There's one, there's one, there's one. Those are sections. How big is a section? You guys remember from your topographic map days? A section is one square mile. Okay, so when you see these squares here with a number in the middle, and the numbers run between 1 and 36, that's a section. That's a square mile. So that means that each side is a mile. Distance from right here to right here, that's one mile. From this point here to here is one mile. From here to here is one mile. 5,280 feet, right? So what do you think the distance is from right here to right there? We could measure it out perfectly. It looks to me like it's around half a mile, okay? If a mile is 5,280, what's half a mile? Half of 5,280 or 2640, is that what you got? Okay, 2640. So we've dropped 50 feet. So the gradient, remember, is the drop, which is 50 feet, over the distance, which is 26. So we say 2620, you double that, I think you get 2640, you get 5280. If I did that right. 50 divided by 2640, I don't have my calculator, but you can figure it out. One of you does that. One eight? Yeah, 0 0.018, that's the hydraulic gradient. That's actually a term we're gonna use and a quantity we're gonna use a little later in the semester. That's the slope of the potentiometric surface. And when I said max before, if you went off, let's say, in this direction right here, you're not going tangential to those lines of equal potentiometric surface, are you? You're going off at an angle. It's still kind of downhill, but it's not the maximum slope. And you can see the line is a little longer, isn't it? So it gives you a little lower gradient. A little, little lower gradient, you increase that number right there, you get a lower gradient. So you want the max. You want the line to cut the shortest distance between those potentiometric 
contours. So basically what we're doing in this example is we're contouring the potentiometric surface by connecting the total heads of the area and then contouring and then figuring out the gradient by the shortest path between those lines, which represents the maximum gradient because our denominator here will be the lowest number. You guys following that? You need another example or what would help you at this point? Want to do another one? Another one? Okay. Let me erase all this. Let's get rid of all this stuff. One cool thing about this tablet is I get to I get to do this. All right, let's get rid of all this stuff. All right, let's start over. Let's do. All right, we're gonna do well one here. And I don't know the answer to this because I'm making this up on the fly, so we get to figure it out together. Let's do well two over here. And let's do well three down there. All right. Now for well one, let's make the total head for well one 3,800 feet. Let's make the total head for well two 3720 feet. And let's make total head for well three 3600 feet. Okay, so you drill wells at those places. That's the level to which the water rises each of those wells, okay? Which one has the highest total head? Well one right here, 3,800 feet, okay? Which has the lowest? Well three, 3,600 feet. In general, how do you think water is gonna flow in this area? North, south, east, west? Always goes from high to low, right? Okay, so you think it's probably going to go somewhat. Let me actually draw this up. Maybe something like that. Maybe slightly different angle, but like I said, we can do the three-point problem with the contouring and do a little better. So let's do that. All right, so what's the first step in doing this problem? Make yourself a little triangle, okay? Okay, triangle that connects all the wells. Now let's contour it, right? In order to contour it, we have to evenly space out the total head values along these lines. So this might take me a minute. So it's 80 different between well one and two. So that, let's see, so... You would want to take a ruler and do this all properly. I'm just sort of eyeballing it here. So that's 3790, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, and 20. Not perfect, pretty close, okay? Between well two and three, we have a 200 foot difference. So we know that right in the middle, we're gonna have 3,700. I guess I should write these in. This is 3,790, 3,780, 3,770. Okay. So that's 3,700 there. We're going to have 10 of these, so that's 90, 80, 
70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. I'll write in a few of these. 90, 80, and then between these two, looks like we have a difference between well two and three of 120. So that's going to be halfway, that's 36, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 10, 20, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Could have scaled that a little better, but you get the point, right? And now you connect heights of equal elevation. So 3790 hooks up with that. 3790, 80, 70. That's a bad line. Let me redo that. So yeah, so you're just contouring these. So it'll look something like this. You can do a little neater job than what I'm doing here. Okay. Where's your highest total head value? The well one, right? So what you want to do is take a path. You can just start it sort of anywhere here. And just draw a line that is the shortest path between those contours. So that would be the direction the water flows. Sometimes you may contour these in a way where the line will curve a little bit. You can sort of see this one curves a little bit, right? That may just be because I drew it poorly, but you can get some instances where it will curve. And that's that's real. That actually happens out in nature. So it doesn't have to be a perfectly straight line. Okay, how do you figure out the gradient now? The gradient is the drop in the head values over a distance. So you can pick any section along here. It doesn't really matter. It looks like it's a pretty constant gradient, the distance between those contour lines on the stetiometric surface are more or less equally spaced. So we could go from, let's say, right, you can just pick any two places. Let's go with that spot right there to say maybe this spot right here. You want it to be over a fairly good distance so you get a better reading. All right, this contour right here looks to be 3770. This contour right here looks to be 3640. That's a difference of 130 feet. So that's the drop, 130 feet. What's the distance between these two? I'll let you guys kind of figure it out. We could measure it precisely. But we're just going to eyeball it for now. Does it appear to be a little more than a mile? Yeah, I think it looks like a little more than a mile. If a mile is 5,280 feet, maybe that's somewhere around 6,000 6,200 feet. 
Again, you could measure this out and figure it out a little more precisely. Let's just say, for argument's sake, it's 6,200 feet. 130 divided by 6,200. What do you get for a gradient? Zero point zero two one. Similar to the last one we came up with, but a little bit different. Yeah, so water in this area in general is going to flow from the northwest to the southeast. So what would you use this for? Well, let's say you wanted to buy a home right there. And there's a landfill right there. You have to worry about the landfill contaminating your water in any way. No. Now, if you had a house down here, it's a confined aquifer. It doesn't mean it keeps out all pollutants. You'd be more worried about this one down here, wouldn't you? directly down gradient. So this tells you the direction that water flows. And ultimately, we're going to be able to figure out how fast the water flows. And if you pump it, what the shape of the cone of depression is going to be in the area. So that's kind of what we're building to as the semester goes on. We're going to start putting in wells. We're going to start pumping them at certain rates. We're going to figure out what the cone of depression is going to look like and then how the water flow is going to be modified in an area. Okay, so that's how we're going to finish out the semester. So let's take a little break, and then we're going to come back and do some geology, okay?